Welcome to the Investor News. In this video, Peter Schiff discusses how inflation is becoming more severe and how the new super core concept does not consider the significant factors that impact inflation, such as food, energy, and shelter. The trend of improving CPI may have come to an end, and now we're going to start to see the numbers getting worse. In fact, when I was watching this report on CNBC, they started talking about a new concept called the super core. And I really hadn't paid any attention to this. I'm not really sure when they invented it. But the super core is supposed to focus in on services. So you take the normal core, which excludes food and energy, and then you take out shelter to get that super core. So in other words, they want to try to measure inflation without the three most important parts, food, energy, and shelter. Once you take those out, there's really not that much left. Apparently, that's what they want to focus on now. First of all, even when they were focusing on shelter, the number was wrong because they weren't using actual shelter. I've talked about that a lot on the podcast. They're not using actual rents. They're not using actual real estate prices. They use owner's equivalent rent, which only captures a fraction of what's actually happening with shelter. But now they don't even want to count that. They want to just look at the numbers excluding shelter, energy, and food. And there you had a rise of just 0.2 and the year over year rise was four. So that supposedly is some kind of consolation. Maybe Fed governors can sleep a little sounder at night, knowing that if you strip out food, energy, and shelter, that year over year inflation is only up 4%. 4% is still a big number. It's still double the Fed's 2% target. And that's after you take out everything that's important. And by the way, the whole idea of looking at year over year core makes no sense whatsoever. It makes even less sense when you're going to strip out rents and other shelter costs. But supposedly, the reason they started focusing on the core was that food and energy are considered to be volatile. And so when you're looking at the inflation numbers on a monthly basis, you want to pay more attention to the core than the headline number because there could be a lot of noise. Energy or food prices could be up big one month, down big the next month. And so you don't wanna look at this volatile series that can be all over the place month to month. You wanna focus on more stable prices. So you look at the core. But when you start looking at inflation numbers year over year, that's when looking at the core means nothing. When food and energy prices and now shelter prices are really going up, it's possible that that can help push down the price of other things because when you spend more money on those necessities, you have less money left over to buy the luxuries. And so those prices may come down, but the overall price level is going up because of food, energy, and shelter. So you can't ignore that and say, well, if we take out all this stuff, the price of these other things isn't rising that much. Well, number one, one of the reasons is because people are spending so much money on food, energy, and now shelter, they don't have enough money left over for that other stuff. So they're still spending a lot more. They're just spending it on stuff that used to be a lot less expensive. But now because inflation made that other stuff so expensive, you've got to cut back in other areas. Now, of course, eventually the areas where consumers are cutting back, those prices are going to go up too. Because once a lot of the excess inventory is cleared out, then the businesses are going to react with lower supply and then the prices are going to go up. So what you might see is that a big increase in food and energy and shelter prices may cause other prices to fall. Initially, those declines are likely to be short lived. And that's what we're focusing on now. We're trying to say, hey, let's not count food and energy, even though we're looking at it on a year over year basis. Now, of course, we did get a little help on the headline number because we got a big pullback in oil prices and other commodities. But part of that was due to the Biden administration's decision to sell oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And so the Biden administration decided, nope, we better sell some more reserves. They can only play this game for so long because at some point they will completely exhaust the reserves if they're willing to take it that far to the point where we have no strategic reserves at all. Because if we get that far, obviously, oil prices can go way up. And what happens if we decide we need 
to have some strategic reserves and we have to start buying them after we've taken the tank down to empty. Imagine what that's going to do to the price of oil, because now not only are you going to have all of the normal demand from all the people around the world who need oil for normal purposes, but adding to that is going to be the demand coming for the U.S. government trying to replenish the 600 million barrels that it dumped on the market in an effort to suppress the price of oil. Now, I'm sure the government is going to lose on this trade. They are not going to end up making a profit. They're not going to buy the oil back cheaper than what they sold it at. They're going to end up paying much higher prices for the oil that they buy than they receive for the oil that they sold. And I think the same thing is going to happen on balance to American consumers. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. They're going to end up paying more for oil because of what Biden did. Now, a lot of that was motivated by desire to get the price down for the midterm elections, which he succeeded in doing. And in fact, maybe had the Biden administration not sold any oil, maybe the Republicans would have got the Senate as well as the House. You never know. But clearly, it helped. But in the long run, it's going to hurt. But Biden obviously didn't care about that. The longest run he could see is the next elections. And now he's looking at his own potential reelection and he's looking at oil prices going up and he's trying to do something to stop it. But if he continues to do this by the end of his term, we will be out of strategic reserves and this game will be over. And I think the OPEC nations know that. I think they're happy to see America get rid of all its strategic reserves because that puts us in a much more vulnerable position than we otherwise would have been had we still had those reserves. Now, when it comes to inflation, you generally have two camps that comprise the mainstream of economic and investment thought. You have those people that think that what the Fed has done is sufficient to do the job. In fact, some of those people think that the Fed has overdone it, that they've actually tightened too much that they've misjudged inflation on both sides. That first, the Fed was wrong in its assessment of how bad inflation was and in thinking it was transitory. But then once they discovered that they were wrong about that and inflation was stronger and less transitory than they thought, they made another mistake by even overreacting and tightening too much. And now there are people who think that the inflation rate is going to go down too much, that the Fed is going to overshoot its 2% target. Now you have another camp that believes that, no, the Fed hasn't quite done enough yet, and that inflation is going to surprise the Fed by being hotter than is anticipated. And this camp attributes that mainly to the labor market. They think that because the labor market is still strong, we have low unemployment, we have all this job creation, that that's why inflation isn't going to come down because the Fed has not succeeded in weakening the labor market. Now, as usual, both of these camps are wrong. Neither of them got it right. Now, the second camp that believes that inflation is going to end up surprising to the upside, they're correct on that. They're just correct for the wrong reason. And they're also underestimating just how much to the upside it's going to surprise everybody. But let me go back and talk about the first camp first, because they have no idea what they're talking about. Right? These are the guys that think that the war is over and that the Fed has not only won, but it's done too much. There is no chance that is going to happen. And again, that's because the inflation that we're experiencing, at least the results of that inflation, the increase in prices, this does not have its roots in the pandemic response in the money that was printed since March of 2020 or the shortage of goods or supply chain bottlenecks that we had during that time period, because you have to go all the way back even really further than 2008. But that's where it really started in earnest after the financial crisis or early 2009, when the Fed first adopted a 0% interest rate policy and quantitative easing. So the Fed has been filling the pipeline with inflation for well over a decade. And now we're just really seeing 
the the consequence they've been there all along it was just harder to spot them because they were hiding beneath a rig cpi so consumer prices were in fact rising faster than two percent we were just not getting accurate numbers from the government but also a lot of that inflation was hiding in plain sight in assets in stock prices in real estate prices in bond prices in the price of cryptocurrencies and all sorts of other collectibles it's just that nobody cared when they thought inflation was making them richer they didn't start caring until it was making them poorer but this problem is a long time in the making and it's not going to be solved with a year of rate hikes, especially when those rate hikes have yet to deliver any type of meaningful change in consumption and saving patterns among the people or the government. People are still spending all of their paychecks and then some. The savings have been depleted. Credit card debt is record high. And what about the government? We just passed the budget busting continuous resolution on spending. That is an inflationary policy, basically by design. And though the Federal Reserve has tightened policy, it still hasn't moved the Fed funds rate above the inflation rate. And in fact, the rate that Americans get on their savings, those rates have barely increased at the bank. No American can put money in the bank and earn a yield that exceeds even the official inflation rate, let alone the actual inflation rate. And remember, in order to really bend the inflation curve, we have to bend both the consumption curve and the savings curve. So by raising interest rates, the Fed can bring about less demand and more supply. Everybody keeps saying, oh, no, we need to throw people out of work, right? That is the second camp, the camp that thinks that the Fed is not going to succeed in its inflation fight because it hasn't succeeded in creating enough unemployment. They're looking for higher unemployment to reduce demand, but that's not the way to reduce demand. You don't want to put people out of work. They need to be productively employed and producing goods and services. What we want them to do is not stop working, but stop spending. Now, clearly they're not going to stop spending completely, but they have to cut back on their spending significantly so that they can increase their savings. And let's say that 100% of the people who were employed decide to cut back on their spending by 10%. They haven't cut back on their earning or their work. They're just spending 10% less of their income. I have bad news for you. If you're not rich by now, you're screwed. And if you're in debt, you're even double screwed. How so, you might wonder. Well, the sad truth is that you're working your whole life to make someone else rich. The mega corporations, the banks, the politicians, everyone is getting richer. They get your money. And what is even worse, they get your time. They get your life. You are not even in a rat race. You're in a financial prison. But what could a solution for you look like? Honestly, I don't know, but I know what a solution for me would look like. It's very simple. I use whatever money I have and I multiply it with 1,000. This could make my life much easier and probably yours as well. If you have $1,000 available and multiply this with 1,000, I believe that this could solve some financial issue for the one or the other. Of course, if you're ugly, you would have to multiply it with much more than 1,000. My name is Marco Stan, and this is what I decided to do. I decided to 1,000x my money. This is not a joke. I know what you may be thinking. You know, what, what, what is this guy talking about? How should this work? This is not possible. Well, I made a detailed video where I laid out my plan. And some clever folks might even want to look at this plan and copy it and do exactly what I do. This is just a little hint on the side. You have two options. You leave. You forget what you have seen. You do whatever you're doing and you hope that somehow you get some other results. Good luck with that. Or you click the link below the video. You enter your email address because I'm not showing this to everybody. You at least watch my video on how I plan to 1000x my money. The choice is yours. Make the right choice. 
join me. See what a different future you could have. See at least how I intend, how I plan to do the 1000x. So click on the link below, enter your email address and I see you on the other side. Your Marcus Dan.